Hello and welcome to this sixth episode of Altitude, the place for us to discuss industry hot topics, innovation, challenges and general gossip on aviation. My name is Louisa Smith, I'm Head of Research and Development for Nats and I'm delighted to be sat in the host seat this month, especially as we're here to discuss such an important and relevant topic. Now as many of you will be aware, just 48 hours ago the government's traffic light system for international travel came into force. Although a limited number of countries have made the green list, it's clear the demand to fly is still very much there. This is met alongside a renewed focus from passengers, society and politicians for the industry to build back better. But what does this actually mean in practice? Climate change is the challenge of our lifetimes. Even more so than the COVID pandemic, it represents a real threat to both of our way of life and to the future of the aviation industry. Will generations be able to enjoy the freedom of travel with all the amazing benefits that it entails that up until last year, we probably all took a little bit for granted? What do we need to do as an industry to make sure this is the case? And what technologies and behavioural changes do we need to be focusing on? Or is it just somebody else's problem? Well, with me today to talk about this topic are two very special guests. I'm thrilled to have Kerry Harris, Head of Sustainability at British Airways with us. Hello, Kerry. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for having me along. And from Nats, we have Ian Jobson, our Head of Sustainable Operations. Welcome, Ian. Hello. Thank you. As ever, you can put your question to our experts throughout the show, and we'll try to get through as many as we can later on. But let's get underway. So, Kerry, let me start with you. Tell us a little bit about you and your role at British Airways and what you're trying to achieve. So I joined uh, BA just back in December uh, from International Airlines Group, uh, which is a parent company of British Airways. Um, so while I was at IEG, I helped launch Flight Path Net Zero, which is our commitment to net zero CO2 emissions. So highly topical for today's uh, subject. So as Head of Sustainability at British Airways, my remit covers diversity, inclusion and well-being. Uh, community investment as well as environment, so quite a broad remit of sustainability. And that's a new team that's been established over the last year. So part of what I'm doing is helping make sure that we've got sustainability kind of right at the heart of our business. And it's going to be really key to our recovery as we come out of the pandemic. And what I'm about is making sure that we've got sustainability really embedded in our business processes, in our culture, in our day to day operations and uh, looking ahead also into our customer experience so that everyone who's flying with us really can see what we're doing on sustainability as well. And so it involves everything from, you know, government policy influence to uh, future technological solutions on sustainable fuels and future aircraft, as well as the here and now. So day to day operations and including kind of carbon offsetting and removals. Wow, that sounds amazing. And so, Ian, um, so sustainability isn't necessarily something I've, uh, you know, we've heard quite a lot about working for Nats, but Nats has been focused on making its existing operation more efficient for airlines. And what, what does that actually mean in practice? And, and how do we measure the impact of flights that on the environment? Yeah, well, it's, it's a good question. But we've had um, an environmental manager or environmental team within Nats since since around 2006, six seven when we recognised that, you know, the airlines and airports really at the front front line of the discussion about sustainability but we had a part to play so we we put together that team back in 2006 7 and actually then um, in 2008 became the first air navigation service provider to set ourselves a target on our sustainability performance um, so you know, what, what do we do uh, to drive sustainability through um, uh, through through the system. Well, there there is much we can do to look at procedures, to look at the way we direct aircraft through through the um, uh, through the airspace system to do that more efficiently. Um, so, you know, when when the aircraft's leaving an airfield, then it's continuous smooth climb up to a cruise level that is the most efficient, and then you know, a continuous uh, low power descent from from that. Uh, down down to the ground again and then across the ground effectively at the great circle distance route. Uh, that's that's those are the things that we can contribute to and actually we measure that, that those those elements for every single 
aircraft in a, in our network. So back in in uh, in 2019, of course, that was around two and a half million aircraft, significantly less this year. But we use a metric called uh, 3DI score to effectively evaluate the extent to which we are driving uh, the aircraft along their most efficient route. Um, so you know, we do that day in, day out. What that allows us to do is it allows us to identify the hotspots in the network where British Airways, for example, may be experiencing um, excessive airborne holding in certain parts of the network. Our 3DI score will point us in that direction and we can put in uh, changes to the airspace in order to, to, to iron those problems out. And we made something like 300 plus changes uh, since 2007 um, in, in our airspace, saving around or enabling around 8 million tonnes of CO2 saved. So there's there's much we can do to support our airlines in, um, in driving sustainability. Brilliant. And both Nats and the British Airways have signed up along with other members of the industry to reach the net zero target by 2050. What's the realistic roadmap to achieving that? Um, if I ask that to carry first. Yeah, so... I'll, I'll come on to that in just a minute, but I just want to reflect on you know what Ian was just saying you know, about the airspace innovation. I think what's really exciting is I do think that NAT is a real leader in the space of, kind of innovation for ATM efficiency, and I think you know I think BA has demonstrated that we're also leaders uh, for BA and, and the broader IAG group, and I think we're just really fortunate in the position that we've got where we share the same airspace, the same geography, and we've got this you know, relationship where we can collaborate and drive efficiency in the network. Um, so in terms of the kind of roadmap to net zero and kind of how realistic that, that is, um, we do have a very clear published roadmap now. So as I've mentioned at the start, we uh, launched Flight Path Net Zero back in 2019, uh, the first airline to make that commitment to Net Zero. And it's great to see that now we, we've got broad uh, consensus across the industry. So both in the UK, where sustainable aviation um, as a whole has committed to Net Zero, through Europe, where airlines for Europe have committed to Net Zero, and through our One World Alliance as well. So we also have broader commitment to Net Zero a huge momentum that's building right across the industry. And so what we've done is set out short, medium and long term initiatives that are going to help us get there. So in the short term, for example, we have our domestic emissions in the UK are fully offset so people can travel within the UK right now carbon neutral. Um, we're also looking at all our ground operations, all our main bases, our operated from renewable electricity. So then our ground fleets, uh, motor talk pushback, tugs, our electric, etc. Then in the medium term, we've got opportunities from sustainable aviation fuel. And in the longer term, looking towards low carbon aircraft, potentially powered by hydrogen, um, and also other innovations like carbon capture and carbon removal technology. So I think, you know, it, it is realistic and I think we've got broad consensus in the industry that we know how we're going to get there. What we need now is kind of government support, continued investment and the right policy frameworks to help that happen as fast as possible. Yeah, that's that's great. And Ian, do, do you have any kind of further comments on that? I think, that, yeah, absolutely. I absolutely support what's being done in, in the aviation uh, industry, in particular in the airline industry. Uh, but, you know, looking more broadly, it's clear, it's, it's clear that actually as, a, as an industry in the UK through the Sustainable Aviation Coalition, you know, even before the pandemic, you know, we'd already committed to a net zero path uh, to 2050. And there are you know, huge amounts of effort going in to you know, the new technologies that will enable that, that pathway. For me, I think the, the, the important thing from a NATS perspective is, you know, um, you know carry the, your, your new aircraft and sustainable fuels and potentially hydrogen and, and electric and hybrid electric are some way down, down the line. They're in development now. Actually, what we can bring um, from, a, from an air navigation service perspective is, is airspace modernization in the relatively near term. So I think that you know, we, we are committed uh, as an industry to that path to, to, to decarbonisation in 2050. And I think that air traffic control can bring them some things in the near term that send that message to the, the travelling public, to, to governments, 
and, and to the society at large that actually this is an industry that is sustainable that has got a plan and I think that's the important the important bit for me. So you touched on a little bit there um, around the, the pandemic. So do you, do you think that COVID and the pandemic has had uh, an effect on how people are talking about environment? I mean, we've, we've seen a little bit more in the press uh, around it, but what's the impact then? If we were doing this before, has it had a, a change in how we're approaching things? Um, um, <laughs> I think what it's done is helped people realise that, you know, big risks that everyone knew was ahead need to be taken seriously and need to be prepared for. I'd say, as Ian said, I think for aviation, you know, we've been working on this for a very long time. You know, in BA, we've had to focus on climate for over 20 years, uh, been part of emissions trading for you know well over a decade. Um, so it's not new. However, I think it's given the you know additional focus on, on the need to drive action and that's really encouraging. So, you know, even in the last year, we've seen, you know, continued commitment to what we already had in terms of uh, flight path net zero, but also even further investments through, you know, two new uh, sustainable fuels partnerships announced, a partnership with Zero Avia, um, a hydrogen propulsion company, and our commitment to 10% uh, sustainable aviation fuels by 2030. So, I think what's nice now is we're seeing you know very kind of concrete action and Ian's point about the here and now is really important because you know even the new aircraft that we're bringing into our fleet at the moment um, are up to 40 percent more efficient than the aircraft that we're retiring so we saw the early retirement of the 747s you know partly as a result of the pandemic but what we're seeing is, you know, the aircraft that are coming in are very significantly more efficient. And that's a great opportunity, a great progress right here and now. Yeah, and, and, and Dean, is there anything that the pandemic has allowed Nats to try differently or to try new things? Well, actually, a very personal point here. As the pandemic struck and, and, and I was um, you know, starting to work from home, I sat in this very office thinking, well, what do we do about sustainability in an industry along with other industries that is really struggling but actually you know around my company uh, as well as around around the industry i found that it was that there was, there was a real can do attitude there was this you know with traffic falling very significantly down to you know maybe a quarter or less than we we'd, we'd normally uh, normally had actually we found there was an opportunity to try things out try new things that we hadn't been able to try out in a system that was running very very close to full capacity so you know we've we've been going around the network looking at well what, what are the things that we can do to ensure the airlines are getting direct routes and and you know the, the, the best service they possibly can because they don't want to be burning extra fuel they don't want to be emitting extra co2 and in fact carrie i think we discussed the other day one of your flights inbound from uh, from Islamabad, actually, um, we picked it up on, on 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 one of our trackers that was looking at its its three dimensional score, and uh, and it came in it came in uh, through the east of our airspace was picked up from Amsterdam by our uh, our area controllers and coordinated with our terminal controllers and gave it a direct route, absolutely direct route to ten mile final at Heathrow, and it had a three DI score of 0 0.5 where naught is absolute complete efficiency so it's those sorts of things that we're trying to we're trying to find in our network at the moment and we won't be able to do that all the time in the network that we have um as as we as, as the traffic comes back but we're looking at what are the what are the co2 savings we can entrench for for the system uh, as a result of having lower traffic and then downstream we need to modernize the airspace in order to make that a more more like a day-to-day -day experience for not just your flight from Islamabad but flights from all over the world. Yeah. So, so you've also just touched on uh, sustainable aviation fuels and electric and hydrogen aircraft all hugely exciting technologies and obviously being uh, head of research and development, I have a little bit of an insight into some of the progressions of some of that technology. But how scalable do you, and realistic do you think that that, that is? And, and when do you think we might be booking um, a ticket on a hydrogen electric aircraft? Uh, Carrie, I guess that's probably best answered by yourself. Yeah. Uh, so, so very scalable. The, the nice thing, so if I talk about sustainable aviation fuel first, the attractive thing about sustainable aviation fuel is it's literally a drop in solution so it can be used on existing aircraft and supplied through existing aviation fuel supply infrastructure 
So it's very attractive from that perspective. And also it can deliver um, life cycle CO2 savings of anything from 70% uh, reduction in life cycle CO2. And if that's combined with carbon capture technology in the fuel production cycle, then it can be more than 100%. So, you know, it's very appealing. Um, we've announced $400 million investment in sustainable aviation fuels over the next two decades. And as I mentioned, we've got um, two investment partnerships. Um, the first one that we announced was with Velocis for a plant in the northeast of England, at Humberside at Immingham. And that's a waste to jet fuels plant. So taking waste that would otherwise have gone to landfill and diverting that into sustainable aviation fuel. And so we are looking forward to fuel from that and um, could be available by 2025. Uh, the plant has now got planning permission. So we're con continuing to just work through the development phases of that. Um, and then the other um, project that we announced is with Lanzajet. Um, and this is a plant uh, based in Georgia in the USA, and this is taking alcohol to jet fuels. So a whole series of different types of waste from either waste gases or agricultural wastes and converting that again into aviation, uh, sustainable aviation jet fuel um, that can be dropped in. And for that, we expect to have the first supply of that coming from the end of next year, from 2022. So. I mentioned before, you know, this is now about scaling up. The technology is proven um, in many different pathways for sustainable aviation fuel, um, but it's still a tiny percentage of the potential demand from aviation. So we need to get over the current cost barrier because it's currently very costly, and we need to scale up the technologies to build to supply it more widely in the network. So that's what we're focusing on now and asking for kind of government policy support and to attract investment to help do that. Um, and on hydrogen, it's a, a similar story, probably um, a little bit newer than sustainable aviation fuel because SAF's been kind of in development for the last decade. And we've really seen hydrogen start to, excuse the pun, accelerate uh, um, over the last couple of years where companies like Zero Abia, who we have invested in, are now flying on kind of test flights uh, powered at, at the moment with um, hyd basically electric uh, fuel cell, which is powered by hydrogen. So it's a hydrogen electric um, hybrid. And they have flown six seater test aircraft um, just recently on a 250 mile flight in the UK and looking to scale that up to a 19 seater by the end of this year. Um, with 70 plus seaters before 2030. So it's quite promising. We What we're expecting to see is by the mid 2030s that we could have a replacement for a single aisle aircraft, the sorts that you would see kind of across Europe, um, an A320 type replacement. Um, and Airbus seems to be supporting that, that time frame as well with their investment in hydrogen. So again, it's a very similar process of looking at what the potential demand could be from aviation, um, what the the scope for enough renewable electricity so that you can produce enough green hydrogen with that, and then how we get the infrastructure ready and preparing for that new fuel for the future. So it's really yeah. exciting. Yeah. yeah, some big some big numbers there and some uh, really good investments. I just to say that the BA are, are involved in. Um, I guess just just Ian, I'm interested to know uh, what, what, when do you think we would be buying tickets for hydrogen electric aircraft? What's your opinion on it? Well, actually, um, I mean, I'm, I'm with Carrie. The, the, the timescales look like they're 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 being committed to by a number of different players in the industry, and you need that you need that that sort of critical mass. So it needs to be the airlines saying we want this. It needs to be the manufacturers saying we're, we're investing in the technology. I think it is it is a, a really exciting future. Um, but you know, as I said earlier, I think you know, those are really bright parts of the future. But actually, for me, you know, this this decade needs to be the decade where we really act on climate change and you know start yeah, yeah. to put in place uh, the you know, the modern airspace that that makes sure that you know, Carrie and her colleagues and all the other airlines don't burn more fuel than they need to uh, in our network. So, you know, there's there are things that we do in the interim, but yeah, you know, really exciting future, I think. Yeah. 
And, and just following on from that, you, you mentioned around airlines and different different agencies. There's obviously a lot of collaboration that's needed in this environment. It, it, I don't, don't mean environment, but in the, this kind of work to bring everyone together. What, what What's going on in that? How do you collaborate in this environment? Um, well, as I, as I said, I mentioned earlier on, just over a decade now, we we designed and implemented this, our three D um, our three D metric for measuring the uh, efficiency or otherwise of all aircraft in our network. Uh, we've been using that now. It's been in play since 2012 as a, an incentivized metric for us as an air traffic control organisation. Um, and actually. What we, what we did a couple of weeks ago was we, we we basically said to all of our aviation stakeholders, airlines, airports, manufacturers, other air navigation service providers, we'd be happy to give you this technology free. Uh, so actually just Monday this week, we got together around 60 or 70 um, aviation stakeholders to brief them on actually how they might implement that, that three-dimensional metric in their, um, in their network or, you know, Across, across Europe, perhaps, so that you know, we recognise that airspace efficiency doesn't stop at our, our, our boundaries, just as our airline customers don't stop at our boundaries. So if we can give um, this this technology to other other entities, uh, and they can they can use it to find the uh, inefficiencies and bear down on them in their networks, then that's got to be a good thing in in the short term, as far as I'm concerned. So we continue to work with these people. You know, we sent them lots of technical documentation, and they're looking at how they potentially might be able to implement those uh, implement that metric technology in their their own airspaces or their own operations. Brilliant. And there's um, quite a lot of work going on from the government, uh, obviously from a research and development invo involvement with future flight, which um, has been talked about on one of these previous altitudes, and also things like Fly Zero, which is an Aerospace Technology Institute-led uh, programme about environmental impacts. And so, Kerry, how do British Airways get involved in some of those initiatives? Yeah, so the, um, the sister project to Fly Zero is Jet Zero Council. So mm -hmm. we sit on various uh, groups within that. Um, it's a really important uh, organisation that and a great, great way of moving forward and getting the bridge between government policy and industry action. And we're seeing, again, lots of momentum building in that. And I think the kind of dual approach of the uh, Jet Zero Council looking at the opportunities for sustainable aviation fuel, touching on the technology and then the ATI running the Fly Zero programme, I think is amazing and just, you know, really encouraging and exciting to see that sort of uh, focus being given at a national scale. Um, and there's lots going on internationally as well. So we collaborate a lot through IATA and we're feeding into ICAO um, with a big general assembly coming up next year, where we're very keen to see ICAO um, adopt a commitment to a long-term goal for aviation globally, um, and looking at the future for Corsia and how Corsia's ambition can be increased so that it really starts to move us towards the kind of long-term net zero emissions type goal that we've seen committed to across the rest of the industry. So yeah, at every level, um, we're just seeing more focus and more cooperation, which is great. Yeah, and it's, it's really exciting, some of those projects, and it's great that actually Nats are also participating in those programmes. So it does really bring together quite a lot of uh, industry experts, which is great to see. So um, just moving on slightly, do, do you guys uh, in your positions and your roles, do you ever come across any resistance on, on talking about sustainability seriously in the industry? Uh, I don't know who wants to take that one question first. <laughs> Um, I, I don't mind going first. I, th I think actually, <laughs> um, I think there used to be a position that sometimes the industry would take that actually, you know, we're quite a small contributor to to, to, to the overall picture. Um, I think that I think that is a thing of the past. I think, you know, yeah, before the pandemic, there was there was a climate emergency, and you know, countries around the world were declaring. Uh, we we had you know the flight shaming movement. I think I think the aviation industry is getting is so really behind the need to build back better. You know, we see across Europe where bailouts have been given to different parts of the aviation sector that those bailouts are. I think quite rightly being linked to um, commitments that, that you know, we need to see on improved improved environmental performance. I think actually as an industry, 
you know, and Carrie mentioned, you know, we, we have the sustainable aviation um, carbon roadmap, decarbonisation roadmap in the UK. We have the same at a European level, another one at global level. I think this is an industry that sees uh, that sees the challenge of sustainability and is taking it by the scruff of the neck, frankly. Yeah, I, I'd agree, Ian. I think you look 15 years ago, maybe there was some elements within aviation that were still saying, you know, we we can't do environment, we're focused on safety. You know, safety is in our DNA, we haven't got room to think about anything else. But I think, you know, that things have moved on from there. And, you know, to illustrate Ian's point again, it, you know, as an industry back in 2008-9, we set global targets, voluntary targets as an industry to achieve carbon neutral growth from 2020 and a 50% reduction in emissions by 2050. And at the time that was aligned to the two degree uh, global ambition on climate. You know, as an industry, we've moved, as soon as the science moved to a 1.5 degree ambition, we reflected that in our commitments and the industry is more broadly reflecting that. So I think it is an industry that's innovative um, and is finding solutions now. So yeah, I don't find resistance now. And what would you say to those people who kind of feel like they're arguing or choosing between flying and tackling climate change uh, when they, you know, when they book their ticket and they may be thinking about the impact on, uh, that they have on their flight? What would you say to those people? Do, and do you understand why they might be a bit anxious about it? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think when you look at, you know, people's individual carbon footprint, flying can often be a significant part of that. And what we're doing is trying to make sure that we're offering passengers the opportunity first of all, to fly carbon zero with us when they fly within the UK, and then by providing a platform for customers to offset um, at wholesale prices that we have access to with our charity partner, Pure Leapfrog, on the British Airways Carbon Zero website, where we collaborated with them to have, um, you know, robust, verified projects that enable carbon offsetting if passengers are travelling further afield. So there's an element of that and then the other part that we're doing is what I just touched on about our engagement with ICAO to make sure that we've got the global solution to pricing carbon, which I think has to be the long term focus and um, setting an effective carbon price globally, not just for aviation, but for the whole of the economy has to be the way that we move so that we're properly mitigating the climate impacts that the industry has. I think, you know, the pandemic showing we want to be together. Flying intrinsically is a force for good and what we have to do is just decouple the environmental impact that it's having and I think carbon pricing is the, the best way to get there cost effectively. Interesting and Ian what's your thoughts? Uh, absolutely I think I think people need to understand I, I, I would agree ICAO is the absolutely the right route for a global solution to the climate challenge and um, you know, the, the assembly next year is going to be a really, really important point. I know Carrie, you and a lot of other people are working very hard in the background to get to next year and get you know the states to agree to that long term that long term goal. I think I think from a very very personal perspective, I think people need to look at aviation and understand that this this is a sector that has a plan to decarbonise and it's showing that it can do that. And whether that's through offsetting in the short term and through technology and airspace and all those other things in the longer term, it's really important that we make it clear that you know, we're not doing nothing. We are actually in action on this and you know, people can travel uh, with the confidence that this is a responsible industry. Yeah, I, I, that's a really clear message and, and completely agree. So just before we come on to some uh, questions that have been sent in, just one more question for you both. Um, so if you could change one thing about how the uh, industry works, what, what would it be? Let's give you a second to think about that. Um, but maybe Ian, I'll start with you. I've got one. I've got one really easy. It sounds really easy, but it's not. <laughs> so actually, do you know, there's one thing that we could do, and I think, Harry, you know, we've, we've discussed this in the past. There's one really relatively simple thing we could do that would just smooth the system um, so well. It, and that would be we actually start to measure our system on arriving on time, not departing on time. So at the moment, our system is set up incentivized on pushing back 
at a particular time. Um, and despite actually the important metric is surely when you arrive at your destination, you want to arrive on time, not push back on time. Pushing back early um, you know, causes causes um, you know, causes sort of um, bottlenecks in in the in the global air transport network, and it basically means that we end up with things like airborne holding when aircraft arrive too early for their for their slot to land. If we could just move from a situation where you know, we 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 uh, aim to arrive on time and push back at the time at, at your origin airport that's co that's correct in terms in terms of getting there on, on at the right time. I think that would be a relatively simple change. It sounds simple, doesn't it? But it's not. Um, but actually, could have a have a, a really dramatic impact on the operation of the system. And think about it from a from a um, you know, from a passenger perspective. You know. You know, my family don't want to know if I've pushed back from my from my origin airport at the right time. They want to know if I'm going to land on time and be home to see them you know, after after a, after a day at work. You know, so let's go to arrive on time, not not depart on time. Yeah. Interesting. And Carrie, what was your, your thoughts? What would um, your change be? So that is the big opportunity, I think. When when you think about sitting in the in the hall, that's the most visible element of it. I think there's other opportunities with. Kind of dynamic route planning and I know Nats has done a lot of work on kind of trying to make airlines aware for example of when you know more direct conditional routes are available for example through military airspace and you know working more effectively together so that airlines are taking up those opportunities when they're there um that that's you know definitely part of it um but again I think in the big picture carbon pricing is going to drive all the right behaviours. So it does, in the end, I think, come back to effective carbon pricing as well. OK, so let's uh, open up to a few of the questions that have been sent in. So thank you for everyone for sending those in. So the first one is from uh, Tom from Heathrow. Currently, airspace is largely governed by noise constraints. How do you see the balance between carbon and noise being rebalanced in the design of future airspace change? That's probably best uh, Ian, maybe to start with. Oh, really? Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Tom. That is a that's a great question. So um, it comes down to altitude-based priorities, really. Um, you're you're right. You know there are you know <laughs> there are laws that are set or, the, or guidance that's set by the Civil Aviation Authority on you know where we should prioritise noise in airspace design and where we should prioritise uh, emissions. I think actually uh, we should be looking to modernise airspace around airports. Uh, with with those communities and and work with them to identify what the noise solutions can be, whether that be something that I, I know you're doing a lot of at Heathrow, looking at respite routes, um, but actually a lot of the benefits uh, even within that lower airspace will come from um, the, the the deployment of performance based navigation, which gives more certainty to the flight, so we'll get the fuel and, and emission savings there. Actually, then we get above four or seven thousand feet. And actually, CO2 becomes the priority, and we absolutely, at the network level, will be focusing on delivering those those benefits in 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 uh, in the upper airspace. But recognise that there is, of course, a a noise trade off to be had in the lower lower airspace. Okay, uh, good answer. And the the next question is probably. Uh, equally answered to by both of you. So it's from Graham. So where does the responsibility lie for routing efficiency? Should the airlines be proactively seeking optimal tracks or is this an ATM task? I'm thinking specifically about dynamic flight planning here. Yeah, it's definitely shared responsibility, isn't it? And so, you know, dynamic flight planning is something that we're focused on. Um, we've got a whole new team focused on our uh, flight planning operation. And you know, putting in software so that we can take account of certain weather conditions, for example, to try and optimise the route on the day, the altitude that they've flown, as well as the route. Um, so I think it is shared responsibility. And again, for Nats, obviously there's some constraint in terms of the capacity, but maybe at the moment the slight bit of leeway that we've got in terms of slightly lower demand, well, a lot lower demand right now, but it might give us some more room to test some of the innovations there. Yeah, and, and I absolutely agree. I think I think I mean, there's a little bit in there for me around actually the airspace we provide you to operate through should be the most dynamically flight planable and efficient. Something we've been doing a lot of in in the lower 
um, in the lower traffic levels is actually engaging directly with the, with, with the likes of British Airways with a load of the information that we've got about about the way the airspace is operating. And actually, you know, we've, we've been working with Middle East carriers who uh, have had to completely reflight plan because they're getting very different routings now. But that means they're arriving too early for their arrival slots and ending up uh, ending up holding. So we're engaging directly with uh, with the airlines on that and sharing data. You know, I know it sounds boring, but actually data is is really at the heart of finding the best way to operate in in, in complex airspace. And Carrie, you and I speak regularly about particular flights and try and understand you know, how can we how can we design that out of the system, uh, whether it's from the from the airline flight planning or whether it's from Nats being able to provide the uh, the routes that you actually want to fly that the most that are the most efficient. Yeah and I guess when you, when you talk about the the airports that's exactly why some of those airports are also engaging in some of the research activities in this environment aren't they so that's really good that it's a collaboration that's, that's coming across the industry to, to achieve this target. So the next question is from Polly so how do you think this net zero target by 2050 Will influence our industry in terms of skill mix and the shape of our workforce in years to come? It's a good question. Um, Ian, would you want to take that one first? I think it is a great, it's a great question actually and, and I think I mean, something we talk about a lot in, in, in Nats is you know actually showing that we are a responsible business so we can attract the right skills uh, for the future. So you know the people that we need to get into the aviation industry have to have you know, net zero, uh, you know, firmly ingrained in their in in their in their being, really. Um, so I think, actually, if we can show as an industry, this is a priority for us, and I think we're showing that. You know, we will we will attract the the, the right people who are able to come in and deliver the sorts of solutions we need. Don't want to push it back on you, Louise, but actually, this is a lot about R and D, about attracting <laughs> the right people into the with the right research credentials you know uh, uh, Carrie I'm sure you have a have a, have a similar view because you know, you know getting the right the rights the right people into your teams is, is vitally important for the net zero target surely yeah yeah absolutely yeah. and I think you know there is a challenge because you increasingly we're seeing especially younger generation you know people are choosing who they work for because they want to have an alignment with their own personal values and with increasing awareness about climate impact, you know, sometimes that could be a challenge for someone to come into aviation. But I think, as Ian just said, with our plan to get to net zero and with, you know, all the exciting innovations that are happening, I genuinely think, you know, this is an amazing story to be part of, you know, help create the change that we all want to see. So I think it's a very exciting time for all of us and hopefully, um, some of the great minds that are out there will come and help us do that. Yeah, that's great. And I'm happy to take the responsibility for research and development. I think it's got a key part to play in, in this going forward as well. Next question from Dustin from NAS, NAV Canada. Have any industry players taken action to try and reduce contrails? If so, how have they done this? Do you want me to take that? Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Yeah, I mean, contrails, uh, an issue uh, that we've been tracking for a long time in in the aviation industry, in particular in Nats, um, we've been working for um, a number of years now with research agencies like Imperial College, but also um, uh, DLR in in uh, in Germany, looking to supply them with with real air traffic data to help their modelling of contrail um, contrail production to to basically advance the science to the point now where it's where it's quite clear that you know this is something we need to act on at the moment. There is a trial uh, with our colleagues in in, in Maastricht Centre to the east where they're looking at. Uh, deflecting aircraft by a number of flight levels where they where they're predicting there could be contrailing at certain times of day. We're we're collaborating with them on that trial, indeed putting uh, temporary operating instructions into our operations rooms to enable our controllers to ex you know, to expect or well, you might see aircraft in a different place because of this contrail trial. Uh, we're also working actually with with ATI and a number of other partners on what we might be able to do on the North Atlantic for, for something similar. So a lot of work going on. A lot of it is research work in the background and very, I'm sorry, boring, but data led. Um, but that we, we absolutely need to uh, we, we need to do that research. Um, but yeah, we need to get into trials as well. Absolutely. 
Um, the next question from Marion from Vancouver Airport Authority. So it just shows how, how many people are, are watching all over the world. So how do you how do we scale up the use of sustainable aviation fuels more rapidly globally? Carrie, would you want to take that question? Yeah. So lots of angles, probably. Um, first one is the ha having the right government policies that can give assurance to investors that these kind of first of a kind technologies can be invested in. So it's trying to get, you know, what I spoke about earlier was two examples of first of a kind technology, our Velocis plant in the UK and the Georgia Lanza jet plant. So we, we need to demonstrate these technologies at scale and then we need to scale them up. And because there's currently a price differential between sustainable aviation fuel and fossil based jet fuel, we need policy support to try and get us over that very much in the same way as has happened, say, with wind power, for example, in the UK, where government initially invested in that and helped the industry scale up. And now it's cost competitive, in fact, cheaper than uh, brown electricity. And um, so it's exactly the same process we have to go through with sustainable aviation fuels is looking for government policy and then funding um, to attract investment. So joint funding between governments and kind of private equity investors. And then over time, the cost of that will come down. And we do think there's opportunities to have sustainable aviation fuel that is cost competitive with um, fossil based kerosene. So that's one element of it. And then there's also there's a balance between kind of, you know, attracting investors and also pushing the industry a bit. So the UK and the EU are also looking at sustainable aviation fuels mandates and the UK is talking about uh, potentially 2% uh, mandate by 2025 and 5% or more by 2030. Um, as I said, we voluntarily committed to 10% uh, in, in our mix across the group uh, by 2030. But I think ideally what we would want to see is a global sustainable aviation fuels mandate, um, again, you know, set by ICAO, because that then means that you've got minimum competitive distortion between different regions when you're operating, you know, in a global system as we are as airlines. So that's ideally where we'd want to go. But there is a caveat with that. And also, you know, it's a balancing act between not setting you know a mandate that's you know currently 10 percent when actually the global supply currently is less than one percent um it has to be realistic and so balanced and staged at the right time but i think that that's where we'd want to go with it really interesting and um so the next question from kel do you think that electric powered flights will become a serious contender for short haul and regional passenger flight in the uk and then a follow-up question is, uh, what are the main challenges to making this happen? I'm not sure who wants to take that question. Well, that's got to be you, Carrie, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to take that. So, yeah, I think, um, so from our perspective, and we're not looking specifically at short-haul electric aircraft at the moment, um, it, it doesn't fit our current fleet network, but I think there probably are opportunities for that. And, you know, some of the applications would be you know, very short haul kind of island hopper type solutions. And we're seeing Norway um, really investing in that, for example, to have electric aircraft or hoppers going out to the islands um, in Norway. And obviously in Scotland, that's a big opportunity as well for the kind of Hebrides and the Scottish Highlands and Islands um, kind of market there. Um, so, yeah, that that is. And I think, you know, both the, the hydrogen and the electric are kind of developing hand in hand and actually sort of mutually supportive of each other. So I, I think that will happen and it's already scaling up quite quickly. Yeah, yeah and I think some of those uh, activities that we mentioned before, some of those government led initiatives have probably helped to define whether what the benefit of them are as well. So probably like just the fast, final question um, from, uh, I might pronounce the same wrong, apologies if I do, so Nuria, uh, how can traffic how can tower air traffic controllers help contribute to reaching this environmental goal and how can we better how can we influence airports better apologies for that one ian that's probably the best one for you well yeah <clears throat> well so certainly in nats we um we have environmental training in all of our air traffic controller training so when they first come into nats and start their training we have environmental modules in there that teach them teach controllers 
depending on what, what part of the airspace they're working, whether it's tower or uh, uh, en route, um, you yeah, know, what are the what are the what are the best ways to deliver environmentally sustainable flight? For air traffic control controllers in 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 control towers, you know, there's a lot there's a lot of stuff that can be done around uh, less than all engine taxi and giving uh, giving pilots the the, the advanced no knowledge of when you're going to have to start other other engines so that you can stay on um, on on single or less than all engine taxi. Um, uh, for as long as possible. There's the most efficient taxi routings. There's actually getting just smoothing out the entire um, gate to uh, end of runway and end of runway to gate process by giving you know, giving the, the most efficient taxi routings. Um, but actually, at the airport level, I don't think I don't think it's le I think it's maybe less about influencing airports. It's it's about uh, collaborating with all of the stakeholders on the air, on the airfield, whether they be the airport, you know, the, the the people in the terminal, the people loading the the baggage and, and servicing the aircraft, the, the flight crew themselves. Obviously, if we share uh, data and information really efficiently throughout that that ecosystem, then actually that's the route to getting those smoother uh, on the ground and uh, and initial initial part of the flight uh, is as sustainable as possible. If that makes sense. Yeah, thank you for that. So, well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today, but I'd like to thank both Ian and Kerry for what's been a really fascinating discussion. And for you all at home for watching, I hope you've enjoyed it. Altitude is back in a few weeks for a special episode looking at cargo and air freight, and we have some very special guests lined up for that as well. So stay tuned for further details. In the meantime, if you have any feedback for us, then please feel free to reach out to us at our email address, which is info at nats.co.uk or via our social media channels. So thanks again. Have a great rest of the week and we really hope to see you soon. Goodbye. Thank you.